Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Tristan Claridge and I'm the convener of the Social Capital Research Group. Uh, our group promotes the advancement of social capital theories and we support anyone who wants to use the concept in research or practical applications. Uh, we have members from about 130 countries uh, we have an active discussion group with about a thousand members and we hold regular webinars from invited speakers. So in this session, we welcome Professor Jules Pretty for a presentation and discussion about social capital and the ills of affluence. Uh, Jules Pretty is Professor of Environment and Society at the University of Essex, Director of the Centre for Public and Policy Engagement, and he was formerly the Deputy Chancellor from 2010 to 2019. He is a Principal Fellow of the Higher Education Academy, Fellow of the Royal Society of Biology and the Royal Society of Arts, former Deputy Chair of the UK Government's Advisory Committee on Releases to the Environment, and has served on advisory committees for BBSRC and the Royal Society. He is among the top 1% most cited scientists in the world, and he is a co-host of the podcast Louder Than Words. Jules has been publishing on social capital for over 20 years. In, first, my fa in, in fact, my first uh, exposure to social capital was one of his articles. In 2001, I was just starting my postgraduate research and I, I came across an article titled Social Capital and the Environment. I didn't really know at the time what social capital meant, um, but I noticed one of the authors was Jules Pretty. This really got my attention because I knew his work was always worth reading, having studied environmental science and natural resource management. So I read the article and before I even finished the first page, I knew this is the concept I wanted to use in my research and I've been using and really obsessed with social capital ever since. So needless to say, it's really an honor and it gives me great pleasure to welcome Jules, over to you. Well, oh, thanks very much indeed, fantastic. I'm going to um, share my screen so that we get the image up of the PowerPoint. Just check that that's okay. Has everyone got that? Tristan? Yep, Marion. Lovely. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Tristan. That was a nice introduction and um, lovely to see everybody. A pleasure to uh, be able to say a few words about social capital. And I've, I've termed this the eels of affluence, which is really what went wrong. Um, and the, so the, the kind of headline of the talk here has been the recent kind of breakdowns of social capital across the world and then the kind of rather secretive almost ways that it's being rebuilt in new forms um, and I'm going to pick on one particular area of rural social capital around sustainability and agriculture. So um, I'm going to make the presentation, work my way through the slides and then open up for discussion. I think Tristan's already said you can pop questions into the chat if you want as we're going along or you can wait to the end to, to pose them. Very happy to, to, to do that. Um, the aim is to split the session in roughly half by with the presentation and then with uh, the questions. So let's let's press on then. So the, the kind of top lines of my talk are this. And, and if you're deep into social capital, I think you will know some of this already, but I just want to contextualize the talk really in the structuration of economies and politics really. Uh, so I'm gonna be, this is the headline really, social capital giving togetherness are key to all human communities and cultures. And so I'm gonna be introducing some terms. I'm not gonna talk a lot about the theory today, but I'm trying to kind of get across some language that helps us understand what, what how we might talk about social capital. Um, so togetherness for me is important, and I'll come back to this later on. I'm going to talk a little bit at the beginning about the neoliberal economic worldview, how recent times have promoted profound selfishness and hyper-individualism that's dismantled social capital and led to many costly social and economic problems. And I'm going to pick on just a few examples just to say this is kind of what's happened during this kind of unraveling over the last roughly 30 years. And yet, this is the kind of headline behind this, is that there's a continued strength of hidden social capital embedded within communities such as in volunteering or caring or the public commons of knowledge and space and institutions, uh, the continuing importance of togetherness in every aspect of life um, and the emergence of millions of new social groups 
worldwide. And that's the, the bit that I'm coming to in part three of the talk. So that's, that's the kind of headline of what we're going to be covering. So let me just kind of go back into this uh, very brief sketch of the emergence of this kind of hyper individualism. It, it had many strands, but, but if you wanted to point to one person who did a lot of this, it was the American Ayn Rand, um, whose two books, her two books, Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged, came to be treated as religious texts um, and led to the formation of a large number of lobbying and even secret societies. Kurt Anderson, the book that I've put on the top right here, his recent book, Evil Geniuses, shows that these things didn't happen by accident. People were actually designing ways of of encouraging hyper-individualism um, in uh, it, starting within the USA, but, but also became very um, uh, spread in many, many um, domains. Um, the neoliberal aims were, of course, to set us free from context, history, external constraints on behaviors, generate wealth fast, and then it will flow or trickle down to others. Central tenet of the of the of the idea behind all of that, which sounded, you know, kind of appealing to some, but hasn't been proven to work, as many of you will well know. Um, uh, but and let me pick up on a couple of those examples. So lots of people have written about this recently and are suggesting Tim Jackson's book there, Post Growth, Life After Capitalism, that many people are suggesting we're in this stage in the 2020s as we deal with COVID and the pandemics, as we deal with the climate crisis, we're also dealing with the end of this stage of capitalism and something different is about to emerge. Now that's not the subject of the talk, but that's the context. And I think that's a very, very real and fair observation about where we sit in historical terms. The key architects of individualism, well, I'm gonna to point towards two in just a moment, but if we just went back to the mid 1970s, the famous Alan Greenspan, chair of the US Council of Economic Advisors appointed by um, <clears throat> Gerald Ford here in the picture, um, in the second from the right, that is Ayn Rand, he was chair of the Federal Reserve, so of influenced economic policy for a long period of time. When he took the oath in the Oval Office to become chair of the US Council of Economic Advisors, he did it with his hand on one of Ayn Rand's books. That's why I say it's a religious text. There's a British um, Minister of Health who was a former Chancellor of the Exchequer, that's the finance minister, who has said, I have her book, one of those two is Atlas Shrugged, by the bedside, and I read it regularly. So just to kind of, you know, these are not, not, not kind of abstract ideas that are sitting there. People are treating it in a particular kind of way. The big boost to um, this individualism occurred under two leaders of the US and the UK in the 1980s. I know that um, those of you in New Zealand will remember that, that you were also early takers on the kind of hyper-individualism in the early 1980s with the, with the, with the kind of breakdown of the school system, for example, and, and the pri almost privatization of that. Reagan said, once you've seen one redwood, you've seen them all. There's a kind of dismissal of the values of nature. And Margaret Thatcher famously said um, in 1987, you know, there's no such thing as society. There are individual men and women. It is our duty to look after ourselves. And they are seen to be significant architects in this, this project. So ground was laid in the 70s and 80s and really kind of pushed ahead since then. Um, during that period, of course, uh, we find that the GDP, gross domestic product, becomes the gold standard of a measure of success of economies. They're almost the sole measure in, in many contexts. Very clever indeed, because it measures the bads as well as the goods. It values destruction as well as creation. So when you destroy something, you pollute, you measure that as a good, and then when you clean it up, you measure it as a good, and it all comes through to GDP. So this, this distorts what matters most to us. And I'm going to just pick on a kind of couple of these examples in a moment. Happiness and giving, longevity, a good life. I'm going to report a bit on some research that we've done around this concept of the good life in just 
part two of the talk coming up to that um, in a little while. So uh, lots of ways of kind of understanding the distortions that, that, that we find ourselves in. If you measure GDP for about 150 countries in each of these two graphs, um, on the left-hand side is happiness for the graph on the left, on the right-hand side is life expectancy. You see this common uh, graph um, shape. Uh, and I call this on the left side a consumption cliff and at the top the affluent uplands. So we know that at very low GDP, more is good. People need more stuff. They need more food, clean water, health, access to education, security, transport, housing, all sorts of things. But after a certain point, more stuff doesn't produce more happiness and it doesn't produce much more in the way of life expectancy. So we get this kind of flattening off. Put another way, uh, the returns on GDP uh, become marginal. Um, so it's a nonlinear context there. So although economies have been seeking this, it hasn't delivered what we might want. Um, if you map happiness against healthy life expectancy, there's a pretty kind of strong relationship that things that make us feel content about life also help us to live long. I'm just putting these kind of thoughts out there to say, should we be identifying the things that are important to us, to our families, to our friends, to our communities, to our countries, to the world as a whole? Or should we be seeking a kind of narrow view of human progress? Well, I think you get where I'm coming from with this, and it's the latter that's been the problem that we've faced um, without, in many ways, realizing it. Um, uh, if you map uh, over the last 60 years, changes in relative changes in happiness within countries, um, which is the green dots against um, uh, or alongside changes in relative GDP, you can see in the countries here, top left, Japan, UK, China, USA, that the GDP has increased substantially in Japan by sixfold over a 60 year period in the US bottom right, three and a bit fold, UK three and a bit, uh, China 10 times that um, because of the enormous growth recently. But, but average population contentment, happiness across that period has resolutely not changed. It's at different levels in countries, but it's not changed. It's stayed relatively straightforward. So, it depends on what we want from life and what we want to encourage through our public policy or through our institutions or through our research or whatever it is. But you can see there's a clear lack of relationship here over time, um, longitudinally over time between GDP and population happiness. Of course, for each of us, we go up and down, you know, one day, next day, one month, next month, one year, uh, things knock us down and other things pick us up again. But that averaged across the population um, is pretty flat. Um, I'm going to come, I'm going to circle right the way around and come to the climate crisis towards the end and how we think about um, engaging in wide scale change. So I wanted to introduce another angle to this, this lack of relationship or, or indeed a, a pointing towards a particular one here. And this is GDP per capita against carbon dioxide uh, per capita tons per year within the populations of 222 countries. So it's just about everybody um, across the world. And um, you can again see these are log log graphs um, so the tenfold increases from each of the larger dark lines. Um, there are uh, 1.4 billion people in the blue dots who currently in 56 countries um, produce less than one ton per person. There are countries towards the top right there, some small, very small countries that produce um, up to 50 tons per person. So there's a large disparity. Um, the calculations that I've worked on, I just want to put this in your mind because we're going to circle back to this. A safe operating place for humanity is one ton per person. 
So if we got it to one ton, shifted that graph, got the blue to consume more, so they came out of poverty, got the green and the orange and the red to consume substantially less, one ton across that middle part there is a safe space for humanity. We stop the climate crisis. So, so we're working a lot in, a, in another kind of area about on the institutions and ways that we think about how to get to one ton per person. And there's an equity argument there. You can see the blue need to consume more, the others need to consume less. Well, let's pick up one other kind of area and that's the impact of, of food because I want to link this to agriculture in just a moment. Over this period, this period of the neoliberal project since roughly 1990 onwards, here are the changes in adult obesity, um, extreme overweight, um, uh, amongst populations of a selected number of countries here. And you can see that the world has gone from about 8% to about 16%. Um, and a number of countries have seen substantial increases. The US is a long way in advance of everybody. And it wasn't until I just showed this slide to myself, I just realized that New Zealand is, is, is second on that list at the moment. Um, but affluent countries mostly have ended up uh, being putting their people in a position of uh, consuming foods in such a way that that has a substantial impact upon health. Two exceptions there, Japan and South Korea. And I'm going to come back to Japan again in a little moment. Um, over that period, a very small change. Um, in those countries with strong food cultures, strong social capital around food, uh, strong um, culture, and, and uh, particularly of plant eating, um, of eating plants, um, plant-based diets, um, has had a big impact upon staying healthy. So again, a kind of mixed picture across the world, but the point I want to get here is just a rapid change. As it happens, remember, 1990, where the baseline for these figures was the year when we exceeded worldwide 350 parts per million of carbon dioxide, the point when we started becoming, uh, creating an unsafe world when it came, comes to climate change. So 1990 was a key year for a lot of these changes. Um, similarly, when we look at GDP against diabetes, uh, carbon emissions against obesity, we see this kind of pattern of uh, uh, rapid change. The, the diabetes changes have happened in just the, since 2010 on this um, uh, left-hand side diagram. So we're in the middle of rapid change, just as we've seen with, with COVID and the pandemics, of course, and, and the lockdowns, and we're at, at the same time seeing a lot of these ills of affluence tied to uh, a driver for um, the climate crisis. Again, I've mapped on that right-hand side here, carbon emissions per tonne against incidence of obesity. And so these things are co-linked. I'm not saying one is causal of the other, but there is a kind of co-linkage between um, the kinds of things that are falling apart for us as individuals in terms of health and um, in terms of uh, uh, indicators for countries, and yet that's not being picked up by GDP. Um, uh, oh, a quote from, from a, a person that we know very well over here. Um, the prime minister uh, of this country um, in the past wrote this when he was talking about uh, the obesity problem, speaking directly at food consumers. He said, face it, it's your all your own fat fault. And that's a quote from a, an article. So I put this here, partly to make a political point, but partly to say, this is hyper-individualism again. This is a kind of recognition of these things happen to individuals. It's If they go wrong, it's your own fault because you should have had more control. Um, it's nothing to do with the formulation of food, of advertising, of the diet, um, of, of the health industry, of the privatization of the commons of, of health, and all of that sort of thing is to do with individuals. And that's clearly 
I'm sure to most of the group here, you, you, you understand the kind of context that we're coming at here, but I want to make it to kind of set the scene for the big changes that have been happening in agriculture. So let me just say something about um, uh, what we've been doing some work around something called the good life or a good life. Um, rather think of this as being kind of multiple applications of the term. So a question that we've been asking is what is the good life and how might it prevent the climate and biodiversity crisis and at the same time make us happier? So actually the term good life is widely used across cultures and languages. It suggests contentment and well-being a life with meaning, a sense of purpose, a life good for us as individuals, as well as others embedded within, within kind of togetherness and belonging, implying obligations for people and nature, and is a key component of happiness. And I've, in the white at the bottom there, there are some translations of, of uh, terms in a number of different countries and languages for something relating to the good life. In Colombia and uh, Bolivia, Buen Vivir is written into the constitution now. It's now the, they're the first countries that have put a good life as an explicit policy objective for governments. Um, and that's kind of interesting. We're seeing the kind of breakdown of saying we should seek GDP at all costs, when actually it's the other stuff that matters more. And if we haven't picked that up in the middle of the of, of these two years of the pandemic, then I don't know when we'll get the message. Um, but that is interesting, that kind of political change. So seven common features, um, uh, uh, seven common aspects feature daily in terms of a good life. Um, uh, and I wanted to kind of point towards these because these are um, uh, common in the two countries I mentioned earlier on that uh, had kept body um, overweight to a minimum. Healthy food, togetherness, the social capital part of things, connectedness to nature, you could argue that's an aspect of kind of certainly the relationships of social capital, but to natural systems, physical activity, personal growth, and ethical and spiritual coherence. And then when we're consuming, um, uh, that it should be kind of sustainable consumption. Now, the interesting thing is that all of these are low carbon. So they begin to open up the opportunity for us to address the big crises of climate crisis, of biodiversity crisis, of inequality, um, through thinking about a positive vision for how we might wish to live. And I'm using the term, a good life seems to work. Um, it does have uh, some kind of popular connotations in, in culture, so it might not work everywhere, but I think it carries a, a certain sort of um, uh, credibility. Uh, I conducted a survey last year in 27 countries of what, what constituted the good life, for an open-ended survey, uh, with 2,000 responses um, towards the end of last year. And these were the things that came out as the most common responses once we sorted through all the, uh, the free text and the suggestions that people came up with. Nature, nourishment, in other words, healthy food, togetherness and personal growth were the big four, followed by physical activity, spiritual coherence, by that, I mean a, a kind of meaning framework, the way that we understand the world. You could call it an ethical framework or you could call it spiritual and then sustainable consumption and some other smaller things, income, sleep, home and settlement, supportive institutions, political freedom and trust. And the bottom two of those are clearly aspects of social capital, uh, of, uh, of, of uh, linking or bonding and bridging social capital, but I'm not going to dwell upon those. The, 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 the big ones are the ones that relate specifically to individuals. So I've just picked out some of the terms that were suggested when it came to um, what I termed togetherness. Trust, give it, I won't read all of these because you can see them, uh, but I'll skip across them. Giving and reciprocity, sharing, gatherings of friends and family, watching films together, wearing clothes made by friends, a gift, celebration and ceremony, 
ritual and festival, visiting and sharing, singing and dancing together, giving gifts. So there were, there were some very interesting kind of commonalities of language and values that people identified as what they thought were the importance, important aspects of the good life for them. Um, you can see when you look at, <coughs> excuse me, when you look at some of the other domains here, nature, nourishment, and personal growth, again, some of these are uh, strongly embedded in doing stuff with other people. So some of them are our individual. People talked of lying on the grass, looking at the big skies, going for a walk with a dog, walking barefoot, but also doing these things with friends and family and, and colleagues. Food also, interestingly, it's not food as calories. Nobody said, I really like food because of the essential nature of the calories I get. They talked about taste and treats and special foods and food as a gift and sharing and eating together. Um, again, uh, common aspects of, of, of a kind of food culture that is broken down um, under hyper-individualism. And personal growth was a very strong component here again. The long-term nature, the infinity games that we undertake that we can continue to carry on doing through life. Pablo Casals was a very famous cellist, world famous cellist, perhaps the best cellist ever. When he was 93 years old, somebody asked him, why do you keep practicing? And he said, because I seem to be getting better. And so there are kind of aspects of personal growth that we might select and choose that we can imagine doing for the whole of our lives. This is not about work and then non-work. This is about kind of meaning and growth and challenge and a whole range of things in life. These are things that people identified. So I think it's kind of interesting that we're already miles away from that, that instrumental language around GDP um, and economy and face it, it's your own fat fault kind of hyper-individualism. We're into something very, very different here. Uh, for me, I find this quite encouraging. So let me pick on three things here. When you start to identify what it is we do under certain contexts and what kind of impact we have on the planet when we do that, it reveals the importance of these behaviors um, around the good life. Here we have um, uh, a beach in the east of England, near where I live, um, a summer's day. Uh, people are sitting around doing nothing. They're looking at the sky, they're looking at the mud, they're talking to each other, they're walking around, they're spending the whole day doing nothing. And when they go home, they will have had a very nice day doing nothing and will not have damaged the environment particularly. I mean, they will have driven there and driven home again. But the, the consuming of this place, of the things that are going on there, the togetherness has a very low carbon impact. Um, so there are things that we can do that are good for us, good for us as a community, but have low carbon footprints. Um, if I were to ask everybody, do you have a picture like one of these on your phone or on your camera? Do you have a photograph of a sunset? The picture on the right-hand side is um, uh, taken from a small plane with a farmer I was flying with um, some years ago across the, um, the Thames, the, the mouth of the Thames estuary in, in uh, uh, England, and in the distance there is London. Um, when, what happens when you see a sunset? Everyone says, oh, it's gorgeous, isn't it? It's lovely, lovely light. And you have a kind of pause for a moment. Is this something that's in kind of written in our genes that we like sunsets? No, it's nothing, nothing like that at all. It's because we've learned a behavior to stop, pause, be calm, and look at a sunset for a moment, to have a meditative moment. And then we tell someone else about it. He says, look at that lovely sunset. Did you see it? Come, come and have a look. So we look at the sunset and we say, oh, it's lovely, isn't it? And that's all it's doing. We're consuming the sunset. And afterwards, it's still there. So consumption starts to feel, I'm being deliberate here and using this language, consumption starts to feel like something a little bit different. And the same could be said of birdsong. You go out and watch the birds, hear a murmuration of starlings over a winter marsh in 
uh, just down the road from where I live in the east of England. Um, you listen to the birds. After you've listened to the bird song, the birds are still there and they're still singing and it's had an impact upon us. So we can think of kind of consumption, relationships between us here and nature, but we can put the same echo with us and other people, relationships that create and build things rather than subtract them. We haven't done much subtracting here. We've just done adding to kind of relationships and our understanding of the world and how we feel. So to agriculture then, let's kind of push this into the context of what's been happening with the emergence of social groups across the world. Agricultural systems also suffered during the neoliberal project in which we still sit. Um, the emergence of a thing called the training and visit system, which was developed um, in the 1970s and then through the 80s, uh, which was a system of extension, which assumed linear diffusion, uh, knowledge from one person to another one uh, in a straight line from expert to farmer, um, that all areas could be treated the same. 500 World Bank projects um, uh, were organized and uh, around training and visit during this 15 year period um, and shown to be pretty disastrous because a lot of them uh, hollowed out extension systems, which were the very social capital that many countries um, relied upon to uh, develop knowledge and to spread it um, and to be responsive in agricultural systems. This then is followed by structural adjustment policies, free market policies in return for financial support, 135 countries. This runs to 2014 um, and resulted in widespread closure of public agencies and the undervaluing of social capital. So again, the same sort of context, but, a, but with a kind of a very um, colonialist approach to things, a very north to south, a very industrialized to developing, whatever kind of language we would use here, uh, that undermined capacity within countries to be resilient, to come up with ideas, to deal with agriculture in a, in a timely way. So that's the context that we've come out, a deliberate destruction of social capital relating to agriculture. Not everybody was doing this um, because you scratch the surface a little bit of almost every country and find these embedded forms of social capital that were there or just survived. It could be argued, I think it's fair to argue, that a lot of the problems started with Garrett Hardin's famous article about common property resources in 1968, uh, where um, it was a it was kind of stated and then believed very strongly that any kind of common management of resources uh, would lead to inevitable destruction because of free riding, because of individuals seeking their own benefits and not working with colleagues. Eleanor Ostrom in 1990 wrote about the governance um, of natural systems, won the Nobel Prize for it. Fantastic. Um, and, and pointed towards the existence and, and importance of social capital in rural areas. A couple of examples here. One, the, the Subak groups in Bali, um, 1800 irrigation management groups within Bali that have existed for 5,000 years in order to manage the water. And irrigation systems, irrigation rice systems in particular, need institutional governance. They need people to work together so that the people at the head of the, of the system don't take all the water and the people at the tail enders don't end up with none, that there is some form of reciprocity, obligations, common institution working together. Um, uh, and places like Bali have maintained those over a long period of time, um, uh, despite those big changes that I've mentioned around structural adjustment. Perhaps one of the most famous um, uh, social structures uh, that have been written about by anthropologists and others is the Kula Ring in Western Pacific. Um, several thousand islanders make huge journeys by sail across the 18 island cultures of the Trobriens. Um, uh, huge area, huge travels, heroic journeys made. Um, 
simply, as it were, to pass on shell necklaces and bracelets who are passed on with a story. So people are carrying these things from one island to another. They have no material value. They have no, they're not benefiting GDP. Don't contribute to economic growth in the formal terms, but they contribute to growth of reputation, to the good life, the connection of stories between people and the emergence then of story becoming a currency. And this is something that interests me a lot, is how can we find ways of, of sharing our understanding of the world um, uh, to encourage appropriate, ethical, morally strong behaviors that look after the planet, that look after people? Well, you need stories to help do that. And in the cooler ring, the movement of sailors, often stranded for months, um, but their reputation increases in making the links between people. It's a large scale system of social capital embedded in the culture that, that determines almost everything. In other words, this is meaningful. All those measures in the, in the annexes of, of, of uh, important bank uh, reports and others that would talk about the, these islands are missing this really important part of the story. So we've worked for um, uh, a number of decades here on sustainable forms of agriculture, which we now call sustainable intensification. I think this was the kind of work that we were working on that you mentioned earlier on, uh, Tristan, um, uh, a recognition of the importance of building the point at the bottom here, social, natural and human capital to make agriculture successful. So the sustainability in agriculture um, relies on doing things that at least maintain and progress towards substantial enhancement of environmental outcomes without the cultivation of new, more land. It's an open concept. It doesn't predetermine technologies. It needs innovation at individual places. And therefore, it needs to build these three forms of what you could call regenerative capital, because they can be built at a particular place and at another place. And they don't necessarily mean that you have to subtract capital from one place in order to build it in another place. They can be built up everywhere, in theory. I mean, kind of, it's not easy, but that's the kind of the background to this thinking about sustainability in, 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 in agriculture. And it is a collective action challenge. So the emergence of Sustainable of discussions around sustainability in agriculture have all recognized that the building of and strength of social capital is a critical prerequisite to environmental outcomes. I'll give you some examples in a moment. Um, so sustainable intensification seeks synergies between agricultural and landscape uh, wide system components. In the end, there's only one border that matters. It's not the field border. It's not the farm boundary or the country one, it's the planetary boundary. And that's the one, the big challenge we face at the moment is the climate crisis. That's the border that matters. So we're seeking synergies between these smaller actions and the bigger systems that they're embedded in. Um, explicit emphasis is upon wider environmental as well as socially progressive outcomes. And it seeks a kind of language that says, this is not going to end. There's not an end point. We can design a system of innovation, of interaction, of developing ways of working, living, farming, producing agricultural products and food, but no package is going to fit every location. We're trying to avoid harm. You could say there's a, there's a, um, a Hippocratic oath here equivalent. Doctors have to sign a Hippocratic oath to say, do no harm. In a sense, we should be saying the same thing when we come to agricultural sectors. We should be saying the same for every economic sector. Do no harm and anything about doing good. So design the systems to make them responsive to the kinds of changes that are coming down the line. So sustainability for me is not it's not about arrival. It's about creating a system of innovation so that we can deal with uncertain things that may emerge. And the key term here that, that I want to just draw your attention to is the use of the word redesign. 
So Stuart Hill from uh, University of Western Sydney, formerly Hawkesbury College in the 1980s, produced this lovely um, uh, framework that talked about efficiency, substitution and redesign when thinking about creating regenerative capital in agroecosystems. I'm not going to talk about efficiency here. That's about stopping waste. Just don't do bad stuff. That's the obvious thing. Then the next bit is substitution. Take away things that are harmful, put in new things that work. The real sustainability comes when we get to the stage of redesign. So I'm just looking at that now. Um, uh, the, there are references here in the, at the bottom of, the, of some of these presentations that go into a bit more detail. I'll point to the one in a moment that, that addresses all three of those stages. But for me, redesign is a fundamental prerequisite for sustainable intensification to have impact at scale, to do stuff over large areas, not just single fields or farms. We need to harness agroecological processes and social processes together. So you're looking for the agroecological benefits, the interactions between organisms and species and habitats, and we're also looking for collaboration across landscapes, continuous experimentation, application of knowledge. And in the end, the transformative aim is the one I just mentioned, eliminate the negatives and enhance the positives. So redesign is a continuing challenge. I'll just give this example of pest, pests and pest management, just to show that you think you've got it right and then something comes along. Wheat blast arrived in Bangladesh in 2016. The fall army worm arrived in sub-Saharan Africa in 2017. By 2019, it was in China and a, and a major, a major pest. Um, the papaya mealy bug native to Mexico spread to the Caribbean, into the Pacific, into South and Southeast Asia, and then jumped to West Africa and became polyphagous. In other words, it eats lots of things rather than just papaya. So now that's that one mealybug eats mulberry, cassava, tomato, eggplant has become a major pest. So in a 10 year period, it goes from being unknown outside Mexico to becoming a major problem. You could just say the same thing with COVID. You know, one minute we don't know about it and the next minute it's, it's, it's on our doorstep and we need to make responses to it. So redesign is a continuing challenge. It just says the sustainability thing is not going to be over. We're going to create new problems like old pests coming back or other things are going to jump up and bite us in, in various ways. And we're going to need systems of co-creation to uh, produce knowledge economies that are going to work for agriculture. And, and I'm now reporting on this piece of work that was in the journal Global Sustainability published this time last year, November last year, uh, where a group of us assessed the, the building of social capital, the relations of trust, common rules, norms, sanctions, connectedness and social institutions across a whole range of systems, agricultural systems, largely in poorer, developing countries, so-called, um, uh, uh, very imperfect term, uh, lots of different language used here, platforms for innovation, councils, water user groups, science and technology, backyard systems, farmer field schools, a whole range of different terms, lovely diversity there. I'm very much in favour of all sorts of different language to to describe what people are doing. And our global assessment, um, our team of 29 authors, uh, reckoned that, that more than 8 million groups worldwide had been formed in the previous 20 years by last year, with a mean size of about 25 or 30 farmers uh, or, 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 or um, kind of individuals in each of those groups. Um, lots of different contexts where that is happening. Really interesting that, that that has become the foundation for emergence of, of personal capability, of collective action and of landscape change. Um, these are the kind of the, the areas, there's the reference to the paper. Um, it's freely available, it's open access. You can just, um, uh, tap that into, into Google and you'll find, or Google Scholar and you'll find a link 
directly to the paper, um, changes in social group numbers over a 20 year period in integrated pest management, forest management, land, water, pastures, financial services, innovation platforms, and intensive small scale systems. And as you can see with the diagram on the right here, the vast majority of this happening in Africa, Asia, Latin America. Um, the countries of the North have been slow to get this going. A very good example would be the land care program in Australia, which was formed in 1990 um, and resulted in large numbers of farmers working in groups for landscape change, dealing with drainage, soil erosion problems collectively. There are not many of those sorts of examples in the so-called industrialized countries. So a lot of the innovation is happening in the, in the global south um, uh, in amongst poorer groups and we're getting landscape change as a result of this. So a few examples just to kind of point to, to, to give a little bit of kind of color to this. The emergence of farmer field schools beginning in rice-based systems encouraging farmers to experiment, research, test what's happening in fields, to look at what happens when they apply pesticides to rice, how good insects are, and good arthropods are killed and how they should be looking after them. If you reduce the amount of pesticides in your fields and you manage for the good insects, you can then put fish back in, as you can see in this picture on the, on the right hand side. Uh, from China, um, and you can end up with large amounts of protein, 800 kilograms, maybe 1,000 kilograms of protein per hectare um, on a, from a rice field um, once you find a different kind of way of managing the insects. Uh, tremendous um, innovation and success spreading across the world. Another example of linking of the agroecological relationships between plants. This is the push-pull system of IPM, integrated pest management, um, emerging in uh, East Africa uh, and spreading to another a number of countries, um, uh, putting diversity back into the field and using the, the natural semiochemicals, the hormonal compounds that are given off by plants that can attract in natural enemies, the pull and push away the pests that are the moths um, and use uh, grasses around the outside of the fields to kill the eggs of the moths, a whole range of redesign to use the ecosystem services, deliberately using this language here, to produce the food we need without causing harm to the environment. To make this work, you need collective action. You need groups of farmers working together not individuals. Um, and that's been the trick, as you can see from this picture on the left hand side here, getting farmers to work together to redesign their systems. Same goes for soil erosion. Um, uh, decades of work on soil erosion across the world, um, a really difficult record of failure in many countries, because it's largely worked with individuals rather than working collectively. And I've given some examples here of what happens when you work collectively with farmers. The middle two pictures are from Tamanadu, the same place at the same time of year where we worked on watershed change through women's groups um, at the same time of year after a three year period, uh, eroded through to productive. San Martin Hilo Tepecque in, in uh, Guatemala, bottom pictures there, same place, same hillside, getting farmers to work together to produce landscape design that, that, that allows for change that benefits everybody. In Kenya, on the right-hand side of that picture there, again, soil conservation in ways that spreads across farms, which needs cooperation and collective action in order to produce the changes that individuals need. We've seen the emergence of what's called conservation agriculture in many parts of the world on the back of these concerns about soil erosion, where farmers are just breaking the five, six, seven thousand year old norm of ploughing. So no longer plough and then find ways of 
direct seeding into the ground, building the carbon in the soil, sucking the carbon out of the atmosphere and producing systems that are productive as well as environmentally good. Again, they need collaboration. The emergence of bringing simple things back into systems, a, a velvet bean, has been a driver of collective change across Central America, down into Southern Brazil, the picture here is from Southern Brazil, substantial changes in soil by getting farmers to work together to grow a green manure in with their maize here. New ways of farming for them, needs them to work together. It's a difficult journey, starting to do something di different that you've never tried before. You need, you need people to help you and to, to lean upon and to experiment and to do things differently together and share the results. And this, this has been a tremendous success. Uh, second last example, fertilizer fallows in Southern Africa, um, in Zambia uh, in particular, um, uh, in, in a number of, um, of other countries of, of Southern Africa and the Sahel, introducing trees into systems, um, and so instead of having continuous maize, you have agroforestry for two years, maize, agroforestry, agroforestry, maize, maize. Over the five year period, you get increased yield and you get the benefits of the fuel wood and the soil carbon. But the big block to this is working with farmers to get them to realize that they're gonna need to put down some of their farm to trees, not to things you can eat and those trees will actually give you more to eat over a five year period than you previously had. So this, the psychological redesign is the bit that's difficult to do. And we do that well when we're doing that with friends and others going on the journey together. So it's that kind of innovation journey, the personal growth bit is best achieved, not with the working with one farmer who wants to work with you, but working with people to form groups in order to embed that change and then to get it sustainable over time. Um, some of the best examples of these sorts of landscape change have happened in soil conservation and agroforestry programs in the Sahel into what is now being called perhaps slightly kind of grandly the, the, the green wall of the Sahel, um, getting trees back into systems um, through pits here, Tassa and Zai, to capture the water, to encourage crop growth, to encourage tree growth. And over time, we start to see these are two pictures taken from a 30 year difference in Niger and Tahua province. Um, uh, the green dots on the color photograph are trees. So there are many places across a wide band of the Sahara through collective action through farmers working together, where there are many more trees now than they used to be. You still see stories where people talk about desertification spreading and causing, causing real destruction. And those people have never been on the ground. They've never seen actually what happens when you build social capital and get farmers working on uh, the things that matter to them, that allow them to produce more food and maintain um, environmental services and, and the greening of the Sahel is a really super example of where that is working. Again, uh, sadly, often just completely missed by policymakers. So journeys lie ahead. Let me kind of pull this together. Um, uh, they always do. <laughs> the good life, as I mentioned earlier, um, is about low carbon and high happiness, high nature and high happiness. It's about personal growth as I was just mentioning with those groups, building social, natural and human capital together and towards what we might call sloth rather than growth. A deliberate use of a, a twisting of the language there and towards sustainability. So rethinking the things that matter to us. So two examples, and then I'm coming to the conclusion here um, of, of um, of what happens when you just see the world differently. So I mentioned Japan earlier, a really interesting period of Japanese history, the Edo period between 1603 and 1868, a period when the borders were closed, there was stable economy, a period of, of uh, um, 
The wars had ended, so there was kind of peace largely within the country and tremendous growth of pilgrimages, painting, printing, poetry, establishment of temples, establishment of new festivals, um, huge number of printing presses in, in the major cities, um, everybody consuming these wonderful examples of these wonderful prints by Hokusai down at the, the bottom right and the bottom left, and the emergence of haiku poetry by, by um, Matsuo Basho during this period. So when you have stability like this, when you have sloth, then other things become important to people. The things that were there already <coughs> start to spread and become embedded. And when you look over a long period in Japan, there are, these are called Shinizi crafts and shops. These are shops that have been little kind of craft businesses that have been doing the same thing for a large period of time. <coughs> Excuse me for the cough. Um, the shop on the right hand side, top right, is a mochi rice and soybean shop that has been producing for pilgrims on, on a pilgrimage, on a particular travel route, the same things in the same family for more than a thousand years. On the bottom left is a guy called Tanaka Iga, who is the 70th generation of producing Buddhist um, relics, again, for people on pilgrimages. Um, and their company, their family company, began in, in the year 950. So when you get sloth and when you see time in a different way, sustainability starts to emerge in a, in a different way. We see this kind of embedded social capital lasting for long periods of time. Another example of, <coughs> of stability in landscapes and what happens with those if we jump north to Iceland, a place where very famous sagas were written a thousand years ago, where also a book exists called the Landnamabok which is the book of settlements, which lists all the farmers in Iceland a thousand years ago. It lists 4,560 farms. Today in Iceland, there are 4,500. So there's hardly any change in the number of farms. So a very stable landscape with strong social capital, and you can go to the places, those three pictures along the bottom there, are places that were mentioned that you can read about in those stories, those sagas written a thousand years ago, there are, there are famous places because they exist in a story where something happened. So we begin to start to see landscape in a different way, less instrumental, more about meaning, more about something we want to look after and sustain for a long period of time. And I think that for me, that's what we're talking about when we're coming to social capital. So um, lovely poet, Emily Dickinson um, from the East Coast of the US in the 1800s, largely a recluse. Um, she almost never went outdoors, but wrote beautifully about the outdoors. She said, tell all the truth, but tell it slant. And what she meant was, I think what we can infer from that is she meant be like a trickster, be like in those stories where you have a character, an animal, a person or somebody who's trying to kind of just change the way that the world looks. So that's what you need to provoke these, these changes in, in social capital, in, in my thinking, and changes in the way that we see um, uh, the opportunities to transition towards low carbon. So this is the penultimate slide, I've got a repeat of it just to kind of take us through these, of the of how we can change behaviours to reduce our carbon footprints. Now these are for industrialised countries against the baselines within those countries, um, so the picture would look different in Ghana, for example, Siapa, I can see you there, um, but, the, but the general tenor of the amount of benefit for reducing carbon works across large areas of the world. So food matters a lot. Plant-based foods are low carbon. So we need to transition towards less in the way of meat and more in the way of plant-based, local, sustainable, organic foods. And we will improve our carbon profiles. Secondly, we need to think about energy. 
There are ways that we can start trying to save a ton here or there by solar PV, by switching electricity to renewable sources. A number of countries have pretty well completely shifted to renewables. Um, Uruguay, for example, has done that already. Bangladesh is planning to have in its social groups that I already mentioned, a female engineer in every one of its 71,000 villages and that to, in order to install solar PV panels and create a rural electri electrification network on the back of that social capital. Transport has opportunities. If we shift towards electric vehicles, something that's happening in lots of industrialized countries, that's a good thing. But the one thing that destroys it all is international flying. Um, and a flight from London to Los Angeles, a one-way flight uses up three tons of carbon per person to get there and another three tons to come back again. So you can do lots of good things in certain areas, but there are other areas that are just highly destructive. So the reason why I've produced this, this carbon schedule of the range of choices for us as individuals is linking back to what I was saying earlier around, around the ills of affluence. We need to make changes in just about every aspect of our life. We're gonna find it easier if we do this collectively rather than individually. But for each of us, the journey will be different. For me, some of these things I've done already, so I'm going to need to do different ones. But for others, their opportunities will be will be a different kind of starting point. So two final quotes to finish. Um, this is uh, a quote from the Tao Te Ching and from, um, I'm, I'm just having a blank, from Mary Oliver, of course, um, uh, the great American poet who died two years ago. Um, uh, two quotes from them. The Tao Te Ching said, two and a half thousand years ago, the best things in life are not things. Um, this is a quote, a translation by the American poet, Gary Snyder. And it's a good reminder that when we're thinking about social capital and personal growth and sloth and rethinking redesign, it's not gonna be things that are the really important things in life. It's other stuff the relationships and so forth. And this is Mary Oliver's wonderful poem. She wrote this famous seven word poem, Instructions for Living a Life. She said, pay attention, be astonished, tell about it. And for me, I think that probably wraps it all up. Pay attention to nature and to other people, be astonished about the world and about what works, and then tell other people about that. That's the way that we're gonna create the stories that provoke the change, that encourage the social capital to happen um, for many more millions or um, uh, than we've mentioned in those 8 million groups uh, just now. And so I finished this the slide with, a, with, with some images of previous books of mine and um, jump on to Twitter if you want to kind of see the, the, the postings that I'm doing several times. Um, a week around these kinds of topics. Um, and that is it, Tristan. Thanks very much, everybody. I see we've got some chat comments which we can come to. Um, but uh, yeah, thanks very much for listening. Great. Thanks very much, Jules. Fascinating presentation. So we will open it up for questions. Um, you can either raise your hand within Zoom. There's a function to do that under the reactions button down the bottom, um, or you can post something into the chat if you would prefer, and I'll happily read that out for you. Uh, but I thought I might start with the first question um, to see what you think. Um, it seems like social capital came about in the 1990s, perhaps as a, a bit of a response to the kind of individualism that you were talking about. And it seems like a lot of people would like to see social capital used perhaps to try to reverse in that individualism or to try to overcome some of its limitations. Um, so I'd be interested in your thoughts on that, but also the second part of the question is, is do you think social capital is a good concept for doing that, given that it is, is basically saying that these, you know, it's using the language of, of economics and, and perhaps uh, encouraging us to be more individualistic in the process of, of trying to take these things into account. Just interested in your thoughts. 
Yeah, very good, very good um, questions, uh, Tristan. Really good point. Um, I, yeah, I've 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 met many people who are are kind of uncomfortable with the term capital in addition to social, um, uh, because capital is of capitalism, um, and so feel that the 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 complexities and diversities and um, differences in cultures and social relations shouldn't be implied to have a, a, a direct link to this term capital. However, I like the, the term, I think no term is perfect, nothing is perfect, sustainability is not perfect, any of those terms that I've used today, they're all, for me, they, they simply seek to unlock a discussion about something. Um, so I use them as keys to, to say, this now gives us the platform for some kind of form of discussion. So uh, this, I think the same argument would go for the use of natural capital when we're talking about nature and its, and its complexity and beauty and otherness and the, the things that we will never understand about the way the world works. And to imply that's natural capital has similar kind of problem, is a similar problematic but, but for me, thinking that these are assets that we can look after or we can diminish, that it takes time to build assets or capital. And when you have it, you get services from it. And then you can look after it and you can also build it up, as I was saying in the middle of the talk, in, in, when thinking of the, these assets as regenerative you can build them up at every single place and they don't require the substitution from another place to create the capital over at this place. So, so I'd still, uh, you know, for me, the terms work. I'm, I'm happy with them, um, but I'm also quite um, uh, careful about the use and the recognition that, that no terminology works perfectly to capture the complexity of the world. They're, these are keys to conversations. And when you can have the conversation, then at least you can say, well, this works over here, but it doesn't work over there. And this has been the problem in the past. So that's the terminology bit. Is this the opportunity to rebuild a different way of thinking that could replace change neoliberalism and kind of the current capitalist model absolutely yes for sure the the time is up um the 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 system that we currently have will change it'll either change because of the destructive capacity of climate crisis if we don't get on top of that problem quickly enough um we've seen what happens with covid and the pandemics um, we might be in a, just this very day about to emerge into a new problem with the Omicron um, uh, variant emerging from Southern Africa. Um, we might, the consequences are economic and the responses that work best are collective and producing collective agreement. And they're falling into a world that has been used to being very destructive of those collective actions, which is why we see such a lot of conflict around it. But I, I'm, for me, the, these are these are this is the kind of end decade for that system, and we need to be creating new forms of social capital, of uh, uh, relationships and obligations and reciprocity, of working together, and ultimately kindness. Really, let's be kind and generous, and let's see if we can make a better world. That's what it's all about, and then we'd think about the mechanisms to do that. I think you made a really good point about social capital opening up those kinds of conversations because it, it does imply, like you said, it implies the importance, the value, the benefit of these kinds of things. But I think also that social capital is sometimes used as a tool perhaps to reinforce neoliberalism or to, to sidestep some of the, the, um, the difficulties or the criticisms of neoliberalism. And so as any concept is, I suppose, it, it can be put to many uses. And it seems at the moment that a lot of the, the uses perhaps are actually uh, almost reinforcing the problem of individualism rather than sort of transforming and, and resolving it. Um, do you have any ideas about how we might be able to sort of push the needle the other way towards transformation? Yeah, I think, again, really good. I, I think I'd probably come back to saying that, that if we can find ways to tell stories about how things can change for the better, stories within communities or within countries or, 
or within sectors about producing different ways of working together within economies, within the existing kind of model. Um, then, then it's it's like I said with Emily Dickinson, tell it slant, tell the story that touches people individually. The, the, the meta story of the research that I was recording there is 8.4 million groups, um, uh, 240 million people, dramatic change over 20 years, you know, that, but that's a very kind of instrumental story. That's a story of kind of numbers and data. The story that you can tell of individuals in particular places is how um, groups of women have come together to produce to, to work on adding value to their agricultural system and selling produce into the market together where previously they didn't. And then they, they start saving money and then they start training somebody to become a, um, a, a, a solar power engineer and the system is being transformed. So I think you can find different ways of telling that kind of story. And for me, I think that's the bit that allows you to get away from, from the kind of co-option concerns I think that you're pointing towards there that the the that these these kind of aspects of social capital can be uh undermined and set people in conflict because after all the idea of social capital and groups is certain numbers of people within a system and certain people outside they might be in another system but then what happens at the board at the boundary you know are people kind and generous or are they being encouraged to be unkind to each other and we, we can think of lots of examples where that's gone wrong. So we, you can point towards where it has gone wrong for sure. Um, but I think that if you can tell stories about those transformations, then they kind of echo for us. We can, we can understand them, whether we're in uh, uh, you know, any one of the 220 countries in, across the world or any one of the 6,000 languages. I think we find the similar sorts of patterns uh, that give us some hope. Absolutely. I can ask you lots more questions, but let's give somebody else a chance. Uh, Isaac has a hand up, but I think we just go back to something that was in the chat earlier. Um, Marion, is there anything in the chat we should address? Yeah, well, Joseph actually asked a comment about the UN Food Summit and um, the uh, how it actually aligns with what you've discussed. And why is Joseph here? Why is it difficult to implement these practices and what type of incentives needs to change behaviours? So, Joseph, did you want to talk to that question? Yes, sorry about that. That's right. Go ahead. Yeah, and it's not only the, you know, the UN, but a, a variety of, uh, you know, any agricultural assistance programs in Africa tend to go the other way, uh, you know, instead of uh, supporting these uh, practices that are actually more doable uh, in, 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 in those settings, but instead, you know, push for things that Africa don't have or other places don't have. And I'm wondering, you know, this, this the reason um, UN um, summit was highly, you know, protested by African farmers and other farmers. And I'm wondering if uh, Professor uh, Preeti has any um, comment on that. And, and why is it really difficult? You know, we have, been, we have been talking about this for a long time, but it's just so difficult to implement and scale up in those countries. What are, what are the, the issues and how, how can that be, uh, um, you know, incentivized so that the, the practice can be implemented and scale up? Mm. Well, um, you put your finger on the problem. We've got things working well and successfully in certain locations. I mean, I can point to, as you've seen in the presentation, examples across Africa, west to east, north to south, of, of, of real you know, heartening successes, but equally examples of where those are not being picked up and where um, systems are, uh, are not being transformed. It, sometimes it just takes time for that to happen and that we just have to keep producing the research the stories, the evidence, the persuasion, seeking the complementarities to say, if you do it this way, if the concern is we need to produce more food, then we can say we don't have to sell it on the back of social change and giving power to farmers 
and rural people in particular ways, because that might be seen as a threat to some political interests or governments. You can say, if we do it this way, we're going to produce more food. Lots of evidence of that. This is something we've been working on for a long time. This is how you do it. And little by little, we find those kind of changes starting to happen. I, I, I don't think it's unfair to tell this story, but when the first time that I went into FAO, into the Food and Agriculture Organization, Joseph, your question was about food summits and, and the domination of certain worldviews or, or the emergence of other ones. We find these days FAO being very supportive of sustainability, which is, which is for me a really good thing. But the first time I talked to senior staff in 1987 um, in FAO, I was told uh, this is not the place to come if you're concerned about the environment. You need to go down the road to UNEP. Here we do agriculture, nothing to do with the environment. And it was a kind of, it was a moment of realization, oh, we've got a long way to go because <laughs> we were trying to talk about sustainability of agriculture. And it was a long way to go, but now they've changed. So, so I, I'm kind of confident you might say, well, the exam question is that we can change quickly enough. We haven't really got 30 years when it comes to the climate crisis. I think we've got this decade. So, so there is a pressure to make change rapid, but we have got enough time to do that in a way that benefits people and natural systems at the same time. So there, there, there is a little window there, a possibility. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of confident and optimistic about it, but you're dead right, Joseph, there's a lot of systems that are embedded in, in kind of old ways of working old new ways of working you know the ones that emerged that i pointed towards with training and visit systems and and uh, structural adjustment and certain ways of thinking about research and extension systems great uh next shall we move to isaac would you like to ask your question i think isaac you have your hand up if you'd like to ask a question Sorry, sorry, I was on mute. So, uh, hi, Professor. Is, is it pretty or pretty? It's how, pretty. How it? pretty. Pretty, yeah. Uh, pretty, uh, uh, very fascinating chat. Uh, really grateful for your insights and your recommendations for further reading. So, uh, I really enjoyed it. Thank you, thank you for making the time. Thank you. So, um, I think this was triggered by the question on, um, the use of uh, the term social capital. Mm -hmm. And I realized that there are actually uh, connections between this conversation and another I have a lot of interest in, which is um, uh, global history uh, and how we got to where we are right now. Um, I'm referring specifically now in this case to European history and how business frameworks, uh, business terminology, uh, business systems became the de facto lens through which we see the world. Uh, I think uh, there are quite a number of authors who talk about it through the lens of uh, the industrial revolution that uh, basically uh, involved the change of perceptions, the development of consumerism, for example, and uh, the attitudes and the ethics that made it uh, possible for us to accommodate the engineering, the manufacturing, the business ecosystems that have uh, so many negative uh, impacts on the environment. So in the dilemma on whether the term social capital uh, is contradictory, is a, is a contradiction in terms, I thought, uh, perhaps there is some fruit to be mined from uh, exploring the origins of the uh, this consumerist society, just mm -hmm. from the from, uh, the value of uh, business thinking and, and business mentality in society. And now I think I'll refer to Professor Brad Gregory is a professor of European history at uh, Notre Dame. He wrote. Uh, he's written a couple of books, but one I'm looking at uh, specifically is The Unintended Reformation, where he talks about how uh, the, 
the development of this uh, consumer society was itself in response to another crisis, to the crisis of uh, the, the wars in Europe, the religious wars in Europe, the conflicts over uh, identity, the conflicts over political territories. So slowly, the societies then just developed this idea. I think it started in Netherlands, uh, with, where the Netherlands was extremely successful in developing uh, trading networks, uh, 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 trading systems. So they realized, why fight when we can trade? And so slowly, that's how basically the, the business uh, uh, framework took over the rest of the world. So there might be value, I suspect then, uh, in you know, going back to that history, because uh, if you go back to the, co the, the conception around religion and the value that religion had before uh, this business took over, there was still a great, there's a, a great deal of focus on uh, community and, and systems and uh, and uh, you know brotherhood, for example. So the problems with religion at that time were that it couldn't, it didn't have uh, frameworks to deal with conflict. So there was just no way to deal with conflict that that came up. So and that's how one thing led to another, and then mm. business took over. But mm. is there because the problem I see in not reflecting on that history, the problem I see in not reflecting on that complicated history that we have inherited so that business terminology is almost de facto, a way of looking at life, a way of thinking, is that then the problems, the, the values that, the, the value that business has contributed and the contradictions it was taking us away from will be forgotten. So that now uh, you are in this dilemma almost where uh, the past did not happen, history did not happen, which I think would be very, very mm. dangerous to take us down that path. Yeah. So yeah, so I hope, hope I have managed to convey mm. my ideas in some sort of mm. coherence. I'm happy to clarify in case you have any further questions. Isaac, thank you very much. For that. that's, that's great. No, I completely agree. Um, I think there are kind of two ways to look at this. Uh, historically embed a kind of understanding of how of course what we've seen i've simplified things to suggest that that some of the kind of large changes have, have really happened in the last kind of 30 years 40 50 years of the of the recent change they're embedded much much longer behind that the climate crisis emerges because of the industrial revolution that emerges because of other things beforehand so so and historical perspective I think is really helpful. Um, I, I'd, I'd recommend um, a book, an additional book if 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 anybody or or writings by Guy Standing he's wrote a very good book called The Plunder of the Commons in 2019. He worked for the International um, Labour Organization, the ILO for a long time. Um, a very good book about about the importance of the commons in all sorts of ways not just the common land but the commons of institutions of health services of knowledge systems and how those commons became plundered in ways to uh encourage the emergence of the industrial revolution and britain had a strong hand to play in that because they were pioneers in 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 that kind of plunder so I think one can look historically, but I think you can also look um, latitudinally as well as longitudinally. You can look at what's happening in different cultures of the world at the moment. So if you put your lens on indigenous groups, people living in particular ways at particular locations, you'll find large divergence. People living in very different kinds of forms, valuing things to them, um, very strongly um, uh, uh, embedded in forms of social capital, of, of kind of togetherness, of belonging. Um, and, and we can learn lessons by looking, as it were, sideways, latitudinally at, at systems today. And that's kind of one of the things I wanted to get across in the talk was, was also to look at those exemplars of ways of living, the good life, as well as looking longitudinally and thinking about the changes that we've had over time. Um, uh, the danger, the, always the slight danger of looking historically is an assumption that, that, the, that there was only one path, the evolution of human societies followed in a particular kind of way. It didn't, it diverged, it went in all sorts of different directions. It's just recently 
that we've seen this enormous convergence in 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 the way that systems work um so i think we can get something from both of those and and uh, i completely agree if if anybody wants to look it's the guy guy standing's book is called the plunder of the commons it's well worth a look because this is ultimately about creating a common dealing with the climate crisis a couple of questions people have, have popped in there to talk about you know local circumstances and how we deal with that in the end we need massive collective action to solve the climate crisis. And that collective action has to be at the moment amongst 7.8 billion people. It will be a few more, but the world's population will be stabilizing before long. Um, uh, and that's the job that we all have, working together to solve this kind of big problem despite the differences and conflicts and all of those kinds of things. So in the end, it's a collective action challenge and we have to find the institutions that would that will deliver on that. Super hard, but it's just the challenge for humanity that we find ourselves in at this particular time. So thanks, Isaac, really good, really good observations. So we're running a little short on time. I think we've got time for perhaps one last question. Um, John had a, a a comment in the in the chat. I'm not sure if it was posed particularly as a question, but John, did you want to um, pose that? I think you're still Sorry, here. I had to unmute. Yes. Yeah, go ahead, John. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure I, I worded it well. Uh, there's, as you just alluded to, Professor Preddy, you, you indicated this is complicated and there's so many forces at work historically and otherwise. Uh, at the moment, you know, I'm just an individual retiree wanting to respond uh, uh, with my own resources. I attend a church here in the United States, and they are currently, uh, during the month of December, they, they have their global missions uh, program, and it couples with another small denomination. Uh, but I'm not sure they're the most efficient resource to which I want to contribute uh, and finances a financial response is just one form I realize my own personal lifestyle and those kinds of things I'm, I'm asking you know what does an individual do even though we you know uh, that's not a great term to use at the moment uh, given the the uh, discussion on hyper individualism is but no, there but no, but your, your point is absolutely right, though. I mean, in the end, it is down to us as individuals, but but working together with others. I mean, I, th I think your your point is absolutely right. Um, I think what I would say is is um, seek to do one thing, and then do another thing. So if if the kind of major concern, uh, which I think is a kind of primary one, is the climate crisis because it has this kind of broad based range of impacts but we could be thinking about food or we could be thinking about volunteering or we could be thinking about transport or creating kind of ways of of of, of um uh you know for example contributing to a food bank or a um a local um uh, urban agriculture project or something i think we can we can volunteer and give and support others if you're thinking about a kind of agenda john um, so you can think, well, how could how can I create forms of kindness and generosity that bring people together? But then we, if you want to frame that in terms of the, the carbon schedule that I produced, what I'd say is that the challenge is enormous. It's so big that it debilitates us. It kind of stops us even beginning to think about what we can do. So I say pick one thing and do it. So um the kind of advice i give a lot in the uk is to say look food is the obvious starting point because it has impacts upon our health and longevity so think about think about a plant-based diet can you imagine that well if you can't imagine that could you go two days a week meat free as a starting point and then start thinking about about the dishes that you could create that are plant-based rather than meat-based and then begin the journey every long journey begins with a single step and so I sort of keep coming back to that bit and it, it, for someone else it might be something different they might be able to afford to buy an electric vehicle in which case great get the electric vehicle that will save two tons per year off your carbon footprint 
marvelous, but not everybody can afford one at the moment. Um, uh, so uh, if you're in Norway, you get subsidies for them. That's why they're 50% of the vehicles in Norway are now electric vehicles, massive change in a short period of time. So um, one thing at a time, pick one thing, give, uh, be kind, volunteer, um, engage with others, and try to do something that lowers the carbon footprint and then do another thing next year. That would be my advice. And then there's quite a few years still to come <laughs> to carry on doing, doing different things each year. Uh, and then we will find we, 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 we solve this kind of a really big challenge that we all face, collectively um, face. Hope that helps, John. Really good question. Yeah, Thank you. yeah. marvelous. Yeah, lovely. Thanks, Jules. Oh, well, we've run out of time, so we'll wrap up the session. Um, for participants who would like to stay on the line a little bit longer, um, you're welcome to do that after we finish. Uh, so thanks very much, Jules, for your time, especially on a, on a Friday evening and all of the effort that you've put into this. Uh, we, uh, on behalf of the entire group and everybody who's going to watch this in the future, we, we really appreciate all of your effort. Uh, so for everybody, um, the, the next webinar will be uh, next week. It'll be Professor Payne um, from Louisiana State University, who's going to be talking about social capital and family entrepreneurship. So if you can join us next week, that'd be fantastic. So I'll just end the recording now uh, and we'll stay on the line. <laughs>